Welcome to New Orleans, a city jam-packed with history, culture, and that vibe where things seem so alive they just can't be real. We're going to have a look at four of the French Quarter's most iconic spots. Jackson Square, the French Market, the Moonwalk, and Canal Street. These are the kind of places where you can practically trip over history while trying to decide if you want another beignet or just kick back and soak in the atmosphere. Spoiler, always get another beignet. Jackson Square, formerly known as Place d'Armes in French because obviously, is one of those places in New Orleans that just screams, hey, you better have a camera out because everything around here is historically significant. But back in the day, this square was not just designed for your Instagram feeds. It was meant for, you know, military parades, which feels weirdly intense for such a quaint area now covered in artists and fortune tellers. It was modeled after a park in Paris because New Orleans really loves to remind you that it was French, but also Spanish. Then French again for like a hot second before it finally got sold to the United States in the Louisiana Purchase. And yeah, that all went down in this very square. No big deal, just some low key history that changed the course of America. But again, Jackson Square wasn't always called Jackson Square. First, it was again, Palace de Arms, which sounds fancy, but then when the Spanish took over in the late 1700s, it became Plaza de Arms, which also sounds fancy, but in a slightly different colonial language. After a great fire in 1788, because it's New Orleans and everything seems to either flood or burn down, the Spanish rebuilt three buildings you will see today. The Cabildo, the St. Louis Cathedral, and the Presbyter. So next time you're standing in Jackson Square thinking, wow, this is pretty, just know you're basically looking at what's left over after everything got crispy in the 18th century. By the early 1800s, Andrew Jackson rose up, wins the Battle of New Orleans in 1815, and the city's like, let's name the square after him. Because that's what you do for military heroes back then. So now, smack in the middle of the square, you got this massive statue on a horse, which was installed in 1856. Clark Mills made it, and fun fact, there are four of these exact same statues in the United States which kind of feels like overkill, but sure, why not? Also, the landscaping around the statue, designed to look super European by a baroness. Yeah, a baroness, no big deal. Don't be fooled by the pretty park vibes. Jackson Square wasn't always just a place to feed pigeons and listen to jazz. During the colonial days, it had a darker side. It was literally the spot where they held public executions including for slaves involved in the 1811 German Coast Uprising. It's one of those things that gives this square an eerie weight beneath all the modern tourism and carefree strolling. Today, Jackson Square is where you go to feel like you're stepping into a postcard. No cars, all pedestrian friendly since the 1970s, and packed with street performers. <laughs> artists, and a rotating crowd of tourists who may or may not know just how much crazy history went down in this one small spot. Okay, so, the French market in New Orleans. It's this old, charming spot that started out as a Native American trading post and somehow turned into a place where you can buy a beignet, a voodoo doll, and some questionable antiques, all within a six-block stretch. Thank you. 
this journey because yes, it's definitely a journey starts at the Cafe du Monde where you can get powdered sugar everywhere, no exceptions, and ends at Look, the flea market by the New Orleans Mint. So basically, in the span of a few steps, you go from let me Instagram my breakfast to is this vintage or haunted? Now I know what you're thinking. Historic, tourist magic. How can it be both? Well, sit tight because the French market has layers. So many layers that it basically starts as an old school meat market because that's how you reel in the crowds. And then, over time, evolves into this very New Orleans mashup of seafood vendors, Creole dishes, and people trying to sell you jazz CDs you'll maybe listen to once. It's been around since 1791, and the fun fact here is that it was originally called the Meat Market. I don't want to have that with a shake, seriously. That's got to be... Who that? Who that? Who that? Who that? Because back in the day, this was the only place you were allowed to sell meat in the French Quarter. I know, thrilling. But as with everything else old, the market went through a glow up. In the 1930s, the WPA, yes, that's the Works Progress Administration, aka government funded We Need Jobs Makeover Squad, came in and gave it a facelift. So the French market became less about meat and more about, you know, all the other New Orleans things. Like today, you can find a mix of historical charm and all the touristy goods you could ever want. Think crawfish, voodoo dolls, tiny alligator heads, and overpriced jazz merch. Classic New Orleans. However, it's not just food and trinkets. The French market is also where New Orleans does what it does best, throw a festival. The French Quarter Festival happens here. The Creole Tomato Festival? That's right, because in New Orleans, we throw parties for anything, even tomatoes. If you find yourself there on a weekend, be prepared for the sensory overload that is the flea market, complete with people bargaining from random treasures with a brass band playing somewhere nearby. It's an absolute chaos field dreamscape for anyone who loves a good impulse buy while being serenaded by horns. And let's not forget the cultural importance of the French market, because yes, there's more to it than just food and festival vibes. It's an essential cultural hub where you'll inevitably absorb some history, whether you want to or not. You walk through, you eat some oysters, and suddenly, bam! You're part of New Orleans' century-long story. Congrats. But it gets even better because the French market is also a bit like a time castle that somehow isn't trapped in time. It's been rebuilt, repurposed, and redesigned more times than anyone can properly count. But it still feels like this strange, magical portal into what New Orleans was, is, and might be. I mean, it's kind of wild to think that this place went from being a meat-only destination, yes, I will keep bringing up the meat thing because what, to a multi-block market filled with crawfish, live music, and probably more than one psychic reading. And the vibe? Immaculate. Picture tourists in full Instagram mode, capturing that perfect beignet shot, while locals are like, I just need my produce, Brenda. It's a delicate dance of old and new, tradition and touristy kitsch, and it just works. The French Quarter Festival cranks that vibe to 11, making the whole area a literal playground for music lovers. In conclusion, and yes, there must be a conclusion, the French market is so much more than just a place to grab a snack and maybe buy a random Mardi Gras mask. It's a living, breathing part of New Orleans. 
and ever involving mismatch of history, culture, and the faint scent of powdered sugar. From its Native American trading post origins to its 1790s meat market vibe, and now into this epicenter of all things New Orleans, the French market really is the heartbeat of the city. So come for the beignets, stay for the history, and maybe, just maybe, you'll leave with a voodoo doll. Because honestly, that's what New Orleans is all about. History, a party, and a little bit of weird. Okay, so the moonwalk in New Orleans. You'd think it'd be named after Michael Jackson, right? Maybe there's a glittery statue, and you push a button and Billie Jean plays? But no. This moonwalk is actually a mile-long riverfront promenade named after Mayor Maurice Moon Landrieu, who had nothing to do with pop superstardom. It's a scenic spot where you can walk next to the Mississippi River and somehow feel relaxed in New Orleans. Yes, that New Orleans with brass bands, street performers, and daiquiris the size of your head. Before the moonwalk, the waterfront wasn't for casual strolls. It was all warehouses, docks, and shipping logistics, not exactly postcard material. The levee was only three feet tall, which did a poor job of preventing floods. Sparler, it flooded a lot. In the 1970s, Mayor Moon had the bright idea to turn the riverfront into a walkable space, and naturally, he named it after himself. Voila, the moonwalk was born in 1976. Now the moonwalk stretches along the river, and while it's just a mile, it feels much bigger with all the activity. You start at the French market where street performers, musicians, and tourists create a whirlwind of energy. Gutter punks add to the weird but cool vibe. Debatable. As you walk, you'll pass landmarks like Washington Artillery Park with its postcard perfect view of Jackson Square. Then there are the steamboats, the Natchez and Creole Queen, floating like relics from the 1800s. They're like time machines you can actually board, minus the yellow fever. Waldenburg Park is the real scenic highlight. It's more than just a green space, it's practically an outdoor museum. It was added in the 1980s, courtesy of Malcolm Waldenburg, who, of course, named it after himself. The Monument to the Immigrant is a beautiful reminder that New Orleans is a cultural mashup, a city built on blending histories and traditions from all over the world. But let's be real, the Mississippi River is the real star here. It's massive, slow-moving, and slightly ominous, but somehow peaceful, with barges, tugboats, and cruise ships moving along. The moonwalk offers the perfect spot to stop, breathe, and watch the river flow, a calm break from the city's usual chaos. Today, the moonwalk is one of the best ways to experience the riverfront. The iconic red streetcar still runs, adding to that perfect New Orleans movie vibe. And the views? Magical. Sunrise on the moonwalk is one of those rare peaceful moments in the city. The air is cool, the Mississippi is calm, and for a little while, it feels like the whole city is yours. The moonwalk is more than just a nice riverfront stroll. It's a slice of New Orleans history, charm, and contradictions. Peaceful, yet chaotic. Historic, yet modern. It all somehow makes sense. So next time you're in New Orleans, take a walk and let the Mississippi work its magic on you. You might just fall in love with the city all over again. Canal is this big, iconic street that has been around forever. And by forever, I mean it was planned to have a literal canal running right down the middle of it in the 19th century. But they just didn't get around to building the actual canal park. But hey, why not just keep the name, right? So instead of a watery divide, they just put this wide median down the middle and called it the neutral ground because it symbolized this whole cultural split between the French Creole side and the Vucure and the American side and the warehouse district. And now, fun fact, every median in New Orleans is still called the neutral ground. It's like a citywide inside joke that everyone just rolls with. Anyway, Canal Street is huge. It starts down by the Mississippi River, where you can hop on a ferry and be transported to Algiers Point, which sounds super exotic, but it is actually just across the river. The other end of the street, though, 
Yeah, that leads you straight to the cemeteries. So it's this weird combo of let's get coffee down by the river and let's contemplate our mortality by the graves, which is kind of perfect for New Orleans, honestly. Back in the day, Canal Street was like the Mall of the South, but outdoors and with way more character. You had these department stores like Maison Blanche and D.H. Holmes, where people would buy fabric, not clothes, mind you, because we're living in a little house of prairie times. Over time, these stores got fancier and bigger, and people were alike. Wow, multiple floors of shopping. What's next? Flying cars? But then the 80s rolled around, and Canal Street started to lose its shine. Thank you, Suburban Sprawl. But wait, the 80s brought Canal Place, which was kind of an upscale shopping reboot for Canal Street. You know, with places like Saks Fifth Avenue from when you're like, I want to buy something expensive after watching a movie at the fancy new theater they put in. Even after Hurricane Katrina, Saks made its glamorous comeback because apparently not even natural disasters can kill Canal Street's love for high-end shopping. And then there's the entertainment side of Canal Street, which is actually kind of wild. The first movie theater in the world was on Canal Street. Yep, yeah, in 1896. Vitascope Hall started charging people money to sit and watch moving pictures. Can you imagine being the first person to experience a movie? Like they probably didn't even know to complain about the overpriced popcorn yet. Fast forward to early 1900s and the street is full of movie palaces with names like the Sanger that are throwing neon lights all over the place like it's Vegas before Vegas existed. Most of these theaters eventually closed down, but some of them are still hanging around because New Orleans never lets go of its cool old stuff. Oh, and don't forget the hotels. In the 19th century, there were some pretty posh places to stay on Canal Street. By posh, I mean if you like fancy 1800 accommodations. Later on in the 20th century, they started popping up with more modern ones, and it got to the point where you couldn't throw a bead without hitting a convention hotel. Even some of the old department stores got into the act, like D.H. Holmes. Now, D.H. Holmes is basically the if walls could talk kind of building. It's one of those stories where you're like, how did a department store end up meaning this much to so many? But yeah, founded in 1842 by this guy, Daniel Henry Holmes, not a creative name choice for his department store. It started as a little business before Holmes was like, I need more space for all these fancy Paris, New York things I'm selling. So in 1849, he moves to Canal Street and sets up this enormous store, which Sparler is about to become the biggest department store in the South. Because why just sell clothes when you can sell them in the biggest building with the most employees and be the place where everyone needs to shop? The real celebrity of the store though? The clock. Yes, the clock on the Canal Street facade. Everyone would meet under this clock because apparently that's what you do before cell phones. Just pick a random part of the building and hope people show up on time. And do you think the clock is just a footnote in this story? No. The clock is legendary. So legendary that it becomes a plot point in a confederacy of dunces. Where Ignatius J. Riley, the world's most eccentric fictional character, yes, including Willy Wonka, is waiting for his mom under this very clock. Ignatius is so iconic to the city that they actually built a statue of him under the clock in full Ignatius glory. Hunting cap, ridiculous outfit, whirling shopping bag, and all. New Orleans loves itself some local flavor and they definitely got a little extra with this one. But as with most good things, the department store era couldn't last forever. By 1989, D.H. Holmes gets bought out by Dillard's because the 80s were basically a time when department stores across America were like quick, merger die, and Holmes didn't make the cut. However, instead of just becoming a sad abandoned building like so many other, the D.H. Holmes building gets turned into a boutique hotel in 1995. Yeah, of course, they turned it into a hotel because if you're New Orleans and you don't recycle your old iconic buildings into something trendy, are you even New Orleans? The hotel goes through a big renovation in 2012 and comes out as the Hyatt French Quarter Hotel. 
which is where you can now stay if you want to sleep in a piece of history and probably tell your friends, you know, this used to be the biggest department store in the South while standing dramatically beside the Ignatius statue because of course, that's still a thing. Canal Street today is the mishmash of history, shopping, and somehow, biotech innovation. Yes, it's trying to keep up with the times, even though it's basically a historical relic itself. With all the redevelopment, including luxury apartments and the reopening of old theaters, it's kind of like New Orleans is saying, we're going to keep evolving, but we're never going to forget the time we almost built a canal. The story technically goes on to the Mid-City Cemetery, but that's a saga for another time. Canal Street, though, is a street that's always changing, but somehow stays exactly the same. New Orleans is like that weird theme park that mashes together a bunch of historical references, some questionable design choices, and somehow it all just works. It's like the Imagineers couldn't decide between French colonial aesthetics, Spanish architecture, and a sprinkling of voodoo dolls. So they went, let's do it all, and also throw in some jazz. And honestly, it's better for it. Thank you so much for watching this episode. Now here's what I want out of you. I want you to subscribe to this channel since nothing happens without your support. I want you to smash that like button. I want you to comment. I really want to know what you think about this video. And I want you to share this video far and wide. I want you to do all the YouTube stuff. And remember, it's not goodbye. It's see you next week on Gulf Coastal Connections. Yeah, I'm ready to see.